Ladies and gentlemen, um, it's now four o'clock. Welcome to our 2020 AGM for Zoo. A quorum of members is present and I can declare the meeting open. Uh, I'm Julian Wilmot, the chair of your company, um, and I have here uh, my fellow directors, uh, Dr. Stuart Green, Gordon Duran, Phil Blundell, our CFO, and Ms. Khalifa, my fellow MD. Um, I'll start before moving on to the formal business of the meeting. I'd like to say a few words about the company's performance in the past year and also about our recent activities and progress. I'm excited to provide a positive update as we approach the end of the first half of our financial year. With our unique technology and service proposition, Zoo has been able to adapt seamlessly to the current needs of our customers through the company's end-to-end -end vendor model. We expect to deliver double digit revenue growth in the six month period to the 30th of September 2020, compared to the same period last year. This is against an industry backdrop in which the suspension of new productions is approaching six months, resulting in a significant reduction in work for all businesses associated with TV and film production, post production, and media localization. We see this performance as a strong endorsement of our business model. As we noted in the outlook statement of the annual report, our ability to offer remote dubbing through our cloud-based based solutions has won new clients and has renewed and deepened commercial ties with existing customers. This will result in significant half, uh, uh, half, first half growth year on year in our dubbing sales, despite the impact of COVID-19 on the production of new titles. It is safe to say that the pandemic continues to have a negative effect on our customers and their traditional suppliers. It has also affected the rate of growth that we anticipated in the period for both our subtitling and dubbing revenues. And we expect the uncertainty to continue into the calendar year 2021. However, this has not affected our ability to attract new customers for these services, which we expect will deliver substantial revenue growth to Zoo in the long term. We also noted that our leading proposition in digital packaging has enabled streaming services to add rapidly back catalogue programming to their catalogues. Digital packaging has also been a major growth area for us during the period as streaming services providers prioritise back catalogue projects given the significant obstacles in new content production. This trend has continued and looking forward the demand for our digital packaging solutions continues to grow rapidly with orders for delivery in Q3 significantly ahead of any other quarter in our history. With our market leading end to end solution, we continue to be a major beneficiary of this shift in industry prioritisation. I would like to thank all Zoo colleagues who have responded magnificently to the dual challenges of changing their working environment and embracing a substantial increase in workload which has strengthened our position in the market and leaves us well placed for long term growth. I would also like to thank our investors for their continued support in this turbulent climate. I note for the record that given the ongoing restrictions of the COVID-19 pandemic, the meeting is being held as a closed meeting at our registered offices with the attendance of a minimum number of directors and shareholders for quorum purposes and that shareholders are not permitted to attend in person. I further note that shareholders are not permitted to vote electronically at the meeting and that we have therefore invited shareholders to vote in advance by proxy. To more accurately reflect the views of the shareholders of the company at today's closed meeting, I am calling for a poll on the resolutions, exercising the authority in our articles of association. This is seen as best practice currently, as it gives all shareholders the opportunity to participate in the decision making of the company and have their votes recorded, even if they are unable to attend the meeting in person. For the purposes of today's voting procedure, I will complete and sign the poll cards in my capacity as proxy. Please note that we have provided a webinar dial-in facility for the shareholders to listen in to this year's meeting. After the formal business, of the meeting, Stuart, our CEO, will lead a brief presentation on the progress that your company has made over the last six months and will also lead a Q&A session. I will now move on to the formal business of the meeting. This year, shareholders have been asked 
to approve eight resolutions. Resolutions one to seven are proposed as ordinary resolutions. This means that for each of these resolutions passed, more than 50% of the votes cast must be in favour of the resolution. Resolution eight is proposed as a special resolution. This means that for the resolution to be passed, at least 75% of the votes cast must be in favour of the resolution. So resolution one, the first resolution is to receive the company's annual accounts, strategic report and directors and auditors reports for the year ended the 31st of March 2020. Those reports to be presented at the meeting are together referred to as the annual report 2020. The annual report 2020 has been made available on the company's website and shareholders who elected to receive correspondence in hard copy have received a hard copy of the annual report. 2020. I advise that proxies were received in respect to 46,970,285 shares comprising 46,766,480 shares in favour of the resolution, nil shares against the re resolution and 203,805 shares in respect of which votes were withheld. I declare the resolution carried in a poll vote. The second resolution approves part of the director's remuneration report, other than the parts containing the director's remuneration policy, which describes how the company's director's remuneration policy has been implemented during the previous financial year. The relevant part of the director's remuneration report is set out on pages 37 to 40 of the annual report 2020. I advise that proxies were received in respect to 46,970,285 shares, comprising 35,790,627 shares in favour of the resolution, 10,975,639 shares against the resolution, and 204,019 shares in respect of which votes were withheld. I declare the resolution carried on a poll vote. Resolution 3. The third resolution approves the reappointment of Gordon Duran, who retires by rotation pursuant to the company's Articles of Association as a director of the company. I note that the notice of the annual general meeting and proxy form contained a typographical error in respect of Gordon Duran's name. I confirm in my capacity as chair of the company that resolution three has been amended to refer to the correct spelling of this director's name. I advise that proxies were received in respect to 46,970,285 shares comprising 46,766,023 shares in favour of the resolution, 457 shares against the resolution and 203,805 shares in respect of which votes were withheld. I declare the resolution carried on a poll vote. Resolution 4. The fourth resolution re approves the reappointment of Mickey Khalifa, who retires by rotation pursuant to the company's Articles of Association as a director of the company. I advise that proxies were received in respect to 46,970,285 shares, comprising 46,776,023 shares in favour of the res resolution, 457 shares against and 203,805 shares in respect of which votes were held. I declare the resolution carried on a poll vote. Resolution five, the fifth resolution approves the reappointment of Grant Thornton as auditors of the company. I advise that proxies were received in respect to 46,970,285 shares comprising 46,765,000 comma 947 shares in favour of the resolution, 533 shares against the resolution and 203,805 shares in respect of which votes were withheld. I declare the resolution carried on a poll vote. Resolution 6. The sixth re resolution authorises the directors to fix the remuneration of the auditors. I advise that proxies were received in respect to 46,970,285 shares comprising 46,760,479 shares in favour, 5,800 shares against, 
the resolution and 204,006 shares in respect of which votes were withheld. I declare the resolution carried on a poll vote. The seventh resolution authorises the directors to allot shares up to an aggregate nominal amount of 248,490.90. In line with current institutional shareholder guidelines, this represents approximately one third of the company's current issued ordinary share capital. The authority will expire at the conclusion of the next AGM of the company or on 23rd of December 2021, whichever is the, the earliest. I advise that proxies were received in respect of 46,970,285 shares, comprising 46,760,420 46 shares in favour of the resolution, 5,925 shares against the resolution, and 203,940 shares in respect of votes withheld. I declare the resolution carried on a poll vote. Resolution 8. The eighth resolution empowers the directors to allot shares for cash without first offering them to existing shareholders on a pro rata basis. In line with current institutional shareholder guidelines for AIM companies, the power is limited to a nominal amount of 74,547.27. The resolution will expire at the conclusion of the next AGM of the company or on the 23rd of December 2021, whichever is the earlier. I advise that proxies were received in respect to 46,970,285 shares comprising 44,514,563 shares in favour of the resolution 2,241,358 shares against the resolution and 214,364 shares in respect of which votes were withheld. I declare the resolution carried on a poll vote. Ladies and gentlemen, that completes the formal business of this AGM, which is now closed. Thank you to those who dialed in via the webinar and I will now hand over to Stuart, our CEO. Thank you very much, Jill, and um, thank you very much, everyone, for uh, attending this session. So what I'd like to do here, as, uh, as Gillian said, was to uh, take you through a short presentation to um, update you on progress of the business um, through uh, the uh, FY20 and uh, bring you up to date to the, the trading statement that we issued this morning. Um, I should say that we, uh, we have a, a Q&A session at the end of the, the presentation. And the way that we'll do that here is through um, text um, submitted questions. So hopefully in your screen to the right hand side, uh, you'll see a, a tab and there's uh, a questions um, section. So um, at any point, at any point during the presentation, feel free to go in and, uh, and type a question in there. And then when we get to the end of the presentation, we'll, we'll take those, quest those questions in turn. Uh, you can also um, vote on the questions. So if someone else posed a question that you would have asked, then um, if you upvote it, um, what we can then do is prioritize and answer the questions that uh, where there's the most interest for, um, uh, from the audience. Um, so if we run out of time, at least we'll, we'll answer the, uh, the most sought after questions or the answers to those questions. Okay, um, so um, I think most people who are on the call are probably very familiar with the company, but I know that there are some who are new to the story. So uh, just a very brief um, introduction to Zoo. We operate in the entertainment industry and our clients um, include uh, most of the biggest names in global media and entertainment, uh, film studios and streaming service providers. Typically we work with companies that produce TV series and feature films or who uh, provide services to deliver uh, such content to consumers around the world. What sets us apart in the services that we offer, which are primarily around localization services and digital packaging um, is that we have developed proprietary technology over the years that uh, delivers significant competitive um, advantages. Um, the software that we've produced is uh, mainly cloud computing software uh, that enables us to operate very efficiently with a whole range of benefits that make us um, incredibly efficient and allow us to pass those benefits on to our clients. I should just say a few words about um, the significant changes that our industry has been going through over the course of the, uh, uh, the last year. 
So um, primarily, this kind of content is reaching consumers now through streaming services. And those services began with you know, pioneers of the industry, the ones that you see on the left side of this slide, that we would refer to as platform first services. So these were companies that developed a, a technology that enabled content to be streamed to consumers over the internet. And then initially what they did was went out to license third party content to populate those those platforms. And of course, over time, these big players in the industry have um, invested more and more capital in actually developing their own original content that's typically exclusively available um, through their platforms. Um, so until um, just over a year ago, the three companies you see on the left there were the biggest providers of these kinds of services in our industry. And then um, last, uh, just, just under a year ago, um, a new uh, initiative um, kicked off from some uh, major media companies. And um, this was from uh, organizations that have their own content that have begun to offer what are referred to as direct to consumer services. Uh, beginning with Apple and, and uh, shortly followed by Disney, um, these companies have, uh, have either have already produced their own content or are producing their own original content and are providing this content exclusively to their audiences um, of their own streaming platforms um, all around the world. And, um, and since, uh, since that time, others have joined um, that, that whole uh, movement and initiative. So HBO Max, which comes from Warner Media, and Peacock, which comes from NBC Universal. And, um, and uh, just a few days ago, um, uh, Viacom CBS uh, announced that um, they would be launching their, their own service called Paramount Plus um, in the spring of 2021. So this is um, creating um, a big shift in, in our industry and the kind of work that we do, because these organizations typically will be um, taking, uh, as well as producing new original content, they'll also be taking a lot of back catalog content and repurposing that so that it can be made available and distributed through their, their proprietary platforms. And, um, and, and because of the proposition that we have, we're very well suited and positioned to be able to deliver those services to them. I'd now like to take you through um, the key four key strategic pillars of Zoo. And these in combination are the things that set us apart in the industry and provide us with competitive advantage. Um, so the first of these is um, innovation. Uh, as I mentioned right at the beginning, we are differentiated by virtue of this software that we have um, invested in over many years um, that sets us apart, apart in the market and brings us um, very significant uh, competitive advantages. Over the course of the last year um, and up to, to date, our focus of our R&D efforts has been primarily in, um, in three key areas. Uh, firstly, in our end-to-end -end proposition, which I'll be speaking about a little bit more in a moment. Um, so by end-to-end, -end, what we're referring to is being able to provide all of the services, a wide range of services that are required by our clients to go from having some content to that content being live on their platforms and available in a form that it can be distributed to consumers all around the world in many different languages. So, um, so we've developed a particular platform called Zoo Studio, which essentially provides an ordering, amongst other things, an ordering interface so that our clients can very conveniently and very easily order all of the services that we offer. And that the availability of that software and our success in deploying that software with uh, uh, one major client has been key to us being able to significantly ramp up the, uh, the opportunity that we have available to tap into this um, significant amount of work that is coming through, uh, through the industry at the moment. Um, secondly, we've um, made a continued and significant investment in our dubbing technology. We see uh, dubbing as a fantastic opportunity for ongoing growth despite the disruption that's happening in the industry at the moment, which I'll return to um, in a moment. Uh, and finally, um, security. So uh, clearly the content that we deal with is, uh, is very precious to our clients, particularly new original content that has never been aired before. So in order to be trusted by them, they need to be absolutely certain that they can entrust us to look after that content, uh, keep it secure and safe. And we continue to invest in technology to uh, enhance security throughout our systems to ensure that um, there is, um, you know, that the likelihood of that, um, of that content reaching someone for whom it wasn't intended is, is negligible.
So those are the key um, areas of R&D that we pursued in the course of uh, the last year. The second element of our strategy is to do with scale. And for us, scalability, which is unique to the way in which we deliver our business, comes from, um, firstly, the fact that we have this cloud software that enables us to collaborate with a large number of individuals around the world, together with the fact that we are in the process, the ongoing process of building up a community of freelance workers. Um, as, as of the, the end of the last um, uh, fiscal year 20, we had um, over 7,000 of these individuals located all around the world, specialists in, um, in uh, providing linguistic services, in voice acting, in, in dubbing direction and, and other disciplines, um, primarily across around 15 languages. And, um, and this, uh, this combination of the technology, the platforms together with this large network of freelancers makes us very agile, makes us able, uh, puts us in a position where we can scale up and down um, the throughput of projects um, very quickly and very easily. The third element of the strategy is to do with the way in which we collaborate with third parties. And two areas in particular that we have focused on in the course of the year have been in building up a network of what we call zoo-enabled dubbing studios. Um, now, um, whilst our, in our, you know, the purest version of our dubbing um, ecosystem would involve individuals working at completely separate locations, there are certainly occasions when it's important to have uh, uh, talents, so voice actors and others, uh, actually working out of the traditional um, recording um, studio. And for that, we've been partnering with uh, some established, um, typically small independent um, dubbing studios around the world, uh, primarily in 15 key languages, in order that we have that capability and we can offer a, a comprehensive service to our clients. The second area where collaboration has played an important part in the development of the business over the course of the year has been through uh, a number of research initiatives that we pursued. So we see um, opportunities to collaborate, particularly with academic experts in the areas of AI and machine learning um, in a number of different areas that are related to the services that we offer. So we have uh, we have had a, a couple of projects underway over the course of the year, and more recently, actually, we've kicked off um, two further projects um, in relation to machine translation. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with machine translation, which is used um, very widely these days to create literal translations of text. Um, the translation of dialogue, which of course is the kind of work that we deal with, is uh, is very specialised and typically. Um, kind of off-the-shelf machine translation systems are not capable of dealing with the with the challenges associated with dialogue due to the um, you know the idiom idioms the other figs of speech uh, cultural references and other things that are contained within within dialogue. Uh, but we've identified a couple of areas where we believe uh, machine learning can uh, add significant benefits to our processes around uh, creating translations of dialogue and we have uh, initiated two projects to pursue those. Uh, more recently, we've actually uh, just secured some funding to undertake um, another uh, research collaboration, this time in relation to um, uh, voice technologies or uh, technologies for um, dealing with the processing of voices um, that has a very particular application and benefit in our ecosystem. And uh, we'll be saying more about that in, um, in due course. The fourth and final uh, pillar of our strategic plan uh, relates to um, the, the partnerships that we have with our clients. And of course, over the course of the year, we were uh, successful in securing a major end-to-end -end relationship with a, a significant player within the industry, and also in deploying Zoo Studio, as I mentioned, our platform that enables clients to take full uh, advantage of the the full range of capabilities we have in our end-to-end -end service offering. Um, so we have um, we have uh, you know, coming through to uh, to date. We've continued to offer those services. Those services have continued to grow. Um, our Zoo Studio platform is becoming more and more embedded within our client um, uh, organization, and that puts us in a very strong position to be able to see further ahead in terms of. Uh, revenues and our order book and uh, gives us uh, uh, much more confidence in the, the revenues that we'll see going forward. 
Um, I just put up the uh, the KPIs that we track on an annual basis. We included them within the annual report. So I'm sure you've all seen these. But just to pick on a couple of these things, um, revenue does, does, doesn't does appear to have moved a great deal. Um, what that hides is the fact that over the course of our last uh, fiscal year, uh, we saw a significant decline in um, sales related to DVD and Blu-ray production. So a few years ago, that, that kind of work constituted the bulk of the, uh, of the revenues that we generated. But uh, we've seen a very rapid decline over the, uh, the recent um, uh, year or two. Um, that now means that we, we're generating just a few hundred thousand dollars a year actually out of uh, providing those kinds of services. So, um, so the underlying growth through our core business and where we see the future of the business was really much more significant. Um, we continue to add freelancers, and in fact, um, we have uh, you know, a greater focus um, at the moment on building up um, you know, a highly capable uh, pool of talent for each of the languages uh, that we are focused on at the moment, um, and particularly in the area of dubbing. And um, on retained sales is, uh, is an important metric that we track. So uh, we were we retained so 97% of revenues from the previous year. Uh, continued through into the um, into the current year into FY20, and um, that gives you an indication of the degree to which we have repeat business. Uh, and uh, and whilst uh, the amount of what you would call truly recurring business is relatively small uh, in the zoo um, zoo uh, revenue stream, we do have a you know a huge amount of our revenues are what you would regard as, as repeating. And this metric gives you an indication of our success in retaining clients from, from year to year. I'd now like to move on to COVID-19 and the impact that that has had. Firstly, um, to Zoo, and I'll move on to talk about the wider impact with the industry and what we see um, downstream. Um, the first point to make here is that, uh, to some degree, um, the lockdown that followed uh, this pandemic has been something of a catalyst uh, for Zoo in that um, the, the services we provide, particularly in the area of dubbing, um, are, have, um, and these are services that we've offered for about three years now, so a relatively recent addition to our service uh, proposition. Um, these are services that where reputation is all important. And, um, and many clients are, uh, you know, like to take baby steps in, uh, in, in working with new vendors of particular services. And as a consequence, um, our uh, ability to scale up um, sales in the area of dubbing has been somewhat constrained by essentially the need to allow a certain time to elapse during which uh, customers can try us out, work with us, um, gain that confidence that we're able to provide you know, first class quality work for them, um, and then to scale up the, uh, the, the volume of work that they would place with us. Um, but clearly, uh, during this lockdown period, um, our cloud-based proposition for dubbing uh, came to the fore for many of these clients. The reason being that the traditional vendors who offer these services in the industry, which are very bricks and mortar type organizations, uh, were unable to continue to um, operate. Uh, um, most of them were closed through, through the lockdown period and even now um, are, are, are not anywhere near the, the full capacity of, the, of offering the services that they, that they provide. So, so this was a time when uh, organizations who needed to complete dubbing projects had very few places to turn. And uh, what we saw was a huge increase in, um, in clients who, are, who approached us and asked us to help us to complete uh, projects. And, um, and, that, and that clearly has, has enabled us to establish working relationships with uh, a number of clients uh, some of which we're already working with and others which we weren't, uh, that we now expect in the fullness of time will, will enable us to um, grow and to accelerate growth beyond what would have otherwise have happened had it not been for the effect of the, of the lockdown. Um, um, in fact, if we look at the, our, the first quarter of our fiscal year 21, uh, the number of projects uh, we were working uh, on for dubbing in that period was three times uh, the equivalent prior year period. So that gives you a feel for how much work we saw in the area of dubbing in the early, uh, in the early days following, um, uh, following the, the lockdown. Of course, what, um, what we're also seeing though is that the new titles that are introduced into the, the market 
um, by uh, content producers have been uh, very much reduced uh, as a result of the fact that these uh, productions have been unable to continue. So, so the work we, that we would normally be doing um, at this time relating to brand new content uh, clearly is at a very low level compared with what we would otherwise expect. Um, what we've seen actually in the market is that our clients who obviously want to continue to offer through their streaming services um, you know, new content to their to their audiences are turning to the back catalog. And so what we've seen actually is a huge increase in work related to back catalog uh, preparation of content, particularly uh, related to the digital packaging that's associated with that kind of content. And, um, uh, and, and that has been driving an element of our growth in, the, in this first half. Um, one of the things I should mention then is that the, the fact that um, there are very few new titles coming through the industry at the moment because of uh, the, the pandemic, that is having an industry-wide impact on dubbing uh, because the bulk of dubbing that is commissioned in the industry tends to be related to newly produced content. So, um, so industry-wide, um, that right now there is relatively uh, little dubbing being um, commissioned compared with what would be the norm at, um, uh, at this point in the, in the year. Moving more widely to talk about uh, the industry as a whole, um, uh, these, these are the observations we would make. Firstly, as I've said already, new feature uh, film and, and TV productions have been halted. Uh, and, um, and obviously the originals that would be produced uh, that would go on to these major streaming platforms that, that we would work on um, is, is, um, has fallen away. And as I mentioned, we've seen the switch to uh, the back catalog. What we're hearing from um, our major clients is that they expect that this, um, uh, this, this uh, postponement in, in production of originals um, is likely to continue for several months yet, um, probably through until the end of our, our current uh, uh, fiscal year. So, so clearly that will continue to have um, a negative impact for the industry as a whole um, and, and to zoo during that period. Um, but clearly, as I mentioned already, what we're seeing is a greater emphasis on back catalog and we're, we're able to enjoy um, orders in relation to that kind of work. Uh, looking at our competitors, uh, as I mentioned, th these competitors are are traditional operations, bricks and mortar operations, uh, many of them with, um, with you know, 30, 40 or more um, uh, studios located in different countries around the world. And those organizations have been significantly impacted. Um, they were obviously closed during the lockdown period. And even now, uh, their operations is, is uh, significantly constrained due to social distancing measures, uh, restrictions on travel, um, the, the need to sanitize environments on a regular basis uh, and such things. Um, so uh, because these organizations uh, work, a large proportion of the work is on dubbing, and dubbing, as I mentioned already, is largely commissioned in relation to new titles. Um, the consequence is that for these traditional organizations, um, they are significantly impacted by what's happening in the market at the moment. Uh, conversely, obviously, Zoo is in a much stronger position, uh, as, is much more agile, uh, does not have all those uh, physical facilities, and, um, and therefore we're able to adapt to the needs of our clients, which we've been doing um, uh, 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 very ably over this period. Uh, one last thing just to mention about um, what's happening in the industry is that we're seeing some of our competitors, particularly the larger ones, beginning to offer what they're calling remote, uh, remote, remote dubbing capability. Now, prior to um, the lockdown, um, the idea of doing recordings anywhere other than in a, um, you know, a designated purpose-built dubbing studio is something that would have been probably largely ridiculed by these uh, large established um, organizations. But given that those, uh, those um, operations are not able to continue in, in their current mode, um, uh, some of the large competitors have begun to provide, um, develop or commission um, or license some existing technology that enables them to undertake uh, a recording on a remote basis. Um, I have to say that for all that we know at the moment, those capabilities are very limited compared with the comprehensive end-to-end -end solution that we've developed. Uh, but nonetheless, um, they are currently um, in the market um, advocating that uh, remote dubbing is a viable way forward. We see that as being a very positive thing. Clearly, until this point, we were the only company uh, promoting the, uh, this, this concept. 
and, and therefore with other major players also being advocates of it gives a great deal of credibility to the approach and that um, we think that over in overall terms that will be helpful to us um, as the market becomes um, more accepting of these uh, new approaches to, uh, to performing dubbing. One last thing to say about COVID-19, actually uh, hot off the press uh, on Monday of this week, um, an agreement was announced between multiple unions that operate in Hollywood and cover all the various different crafts um, in, in the in the film and, and TV industry, um, which uh, which was signed with the Motion Pictures Association of America, which represents all the major studios, and it is around uh, protocols and arrangements that will be put into place to enable productions to resume. So uh, productions have been closed down for for six months. And um, and we've heard of some cases where uh, production companies have tried to resume production, um, but of course, uh, 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 California and Los Angeles in particular has been very hard hit by the pandemic, and that has uh, often those efforts have been um, foiled by um, uh, incidents of, of infections and such like. So this uh, this arrangement that was announced on Monday um, sets out uh, certain protocols and um, guidelines. Uh, through which um, it is hoped that productions can 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 get back into um, into full swing. So we'll wait to see what uh, what effect that that has, and whether indeed um, it will allow resumption of, of production of TV content and feature films. So um, finally, um, the trading update that we issued this morning that that uh, Julian read through earlier, just to put a little bit of flesh on, on the bones of that. Um, uh, obviously, we've talked about uh, double-digit revenue growth in, in our first half, and um, and it's important just to recognise the significance of that. Uh, we're looking at a situation where most, if not all, of our competitors have seen a revenue decline during this period, and we are uh, we have delivered uh, growth. So, against this backdrop of, um, of new productions being suspended, uh, that in itself is very um, impressive. And it is an endorsement, we believe, of our business model, of our end-to-end -end approach, supported by proprietary technology that enables us to flex and adapt very quickly, very easily, and very efficiently to the needs of our clients. And of course, the needs of our clients have changed significantly over this period. We've won uh, new dubbing clients due to uh, our Azudub's platform, which has enabled us to continue. So. So, you know, for us, it's been totally business as usual during the lockdown period and beyond. We've been able to operate without um, skipping a beat. And, um, and Zoo Dubs is uh, the solution through which we've been able to continue to offer dubbing services when others have been unable to do so. Um, as a result, we expect to see uh, significant growth year on year in dubbing in, in our first half. So a lot of that coming um, in our first quarter as a result of uh, the uh, these these projects that were unable to complete in in traditional studios where we were able to help out, but I should also mention that um, that because of the suspension in in production, we expect um, subtitling and dubbing services inevitably to be impacted by the fact that there is less new original content coming through. So we are seeing lots of back catalogue content, uh, typically. Um, that comes with less requirement for dubbing, but actually a greater requirement for uh, digital packaging. Um, so across our end-to-end -end services, we expect to see substantial growth um, over the long term. And, um, and uh, specifically in relation to digital packaging, which is growing strongly. Um, uh, digital packaging obviously is a feature uh, and a requirement both when dealing with new original content as well as catalog content. But in the case of catalog content, there's a lot more of it to do. You know, this is content that was destined and designed for other kinds of uh, distribution. And there's inevitably more work to do to get that in a form where it's ready to go out on a, a streaming video on demand service. Um, so that is driving uh, demand uh, for our services at the moment. And at the moment we see orders in quarter three for, uh, for digital packaging substantially ahead of uh, where they've been in the past. So, um, you know, in summary, um, our end-to-end -end proposition powered by our proprietary technologies places Zoo um, in an excellent uh, position to continue to grow despite these um, adverse changes that are taking place in the, in the market.
I'll just wrap up with our investment summary. Um, so uh, in summary, um, we have a strategy that really hinges around that technology first approach. Um, and the technology provides us with differentiation um, and its significant benefits, uh, both to us internally in terms of our operations, as well as to our clients. Uh, we are very scalable and very agile based on the fact that we have this cloud-based software and a significant element of the cost associated with the services we provide is fulfilled through freelancers who we only engage um, for projects um, as they are needed. Uh, we're in a growth market. This is um, already a large specialized you know, uh, niche but, but high value market, uh, which is continuing to grow as new services are coming to market, as those services are going to into more countries, and as those uh, countries require more languages. So uh, we look on this as uh, a market that's really still in its infancy and uh, has many years to play out in terms of ongoing growth. And finally, uh, we've been providing services of these kinds and, and, and technologies to major Hollywood studios for well over 15 years now. Uh, we're very much steeped in this industry. We know it well, we know the major players. We are uh, very successful at developing these technologies and delivering first rate services. And we're confident that um, that combination will enable us to continue to grow as we move forward. That's the end of the presentation. I have one more thing for you. Uh, we, uh, we would normally at uh, our AGM show some demonstrations of the uh, software in action. Um, and uh, so this time what we decided to do was produce a little video that, um, that kind of takes you behind the scenes of, um, of Zoo Dubs, which is our, our dubbing platform. And, um, uh, and so we, uh, we wanted you to be the first to see this. And uh, so Johnny, if you're able to play us the video um, and uh, sit back and enjoy. I think the future of cloud dubbing is that far more studios with far more content are going to start working on a cloud-based platform because it's just so much more convenient. Zoo Digital provides cloud dubbing services in all languages using its proprietary Zoo Dubs platform. Hello, Daniel. Hi. Hello, Sandra. Grüß dich. A global network of highly experienced directors and voice talent work together to create dubbed audio for some of the world's most watched content. The ZooDubs platform supports the entire dubbing workflow, streamlining the process from end to end. Voice talent and directors work together in real time from anywhere in the world. They collaborate seamlessly and securely in the platform, whether in the same studio or recording remotely on different continents. Whatever the recording location, ZooDubs is designed to deliver guaranteed audio quality every time. One, two, three. The platform performs session tests prior to each recording session. This validates the environment and approves the user's recording equipment. Polizei here. Is the hawk. Scripted content such as feature films typically use lip sync dubbing. This requires the voice actor to revoice the speech of the original on screen performer. To deliver a high quality dub, the voice actor must synchronize their speech with the original content, mirroring the mouth movements and overall performance of the on screen actor as closely as possible. The Rhythmaband feature in ZooDub supports the actor and director to achieve an authentic, synchronized performance. The dubbing director's role is to draw out the best performance from the voice actor. Hello, Mama. Using ZooDubs, the director drives and controls the recording session, leaving the voice actor free to deliver the same creative performance they would in any dubbing studio setting. Okay, are you happy with it or do you want me to take it? In traditional dubbing, voice actors perform with paper scripts in hand. The ZooDubs platform digitizes the script and has it centralized in the platform for the director and actor to work from. 
Dass der Milchreis war nicht ganz sauber. Nehmen wir noch eine auf, ja? Okay, hier wieder. Each line is recorded in turn and the platform ensures no lines are missed during the recording session. Ich, ich bin dann gleich da. Ja? Okay, tschüss. From time to time people that is not used to work remotely uh, yet ask me, do you think the online thing is something that is going to happen in the future? And I always reply, no, it's happening now. Using Zoodubs, experienced voiceover artists can run sessions themselves once they have worked with the director to establish the desired tone and style. This offers an efficient and effective approach to create high quality lecturing, audio description, or UN style voiceover. Tenías esa chispa en los ojos. Quedé en trance, maravillada. In view of the pandemic, Zoodubs was ahead of its time. And in view of the pandemic, every actor and voice actor who's had remote recording facilities before the pandemic uh, was also ahead of their time. I think that Zoo Digital is leading the way, and I think that's the way it's going from now on. Cloud dubbing is the evolution of traditional dubbing services. It connects the industry's best talent with the world's most watched content and enables Zoo to deliver dubbed shows and movies to audiences everywhere. Zoo, leading the future. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, so um, what I'd like to do now is move to the Q&A session. Um, so thank you everyone who has uh, already submitted questions. Um, uh, just a reminder, they should be on the right hand of the screen in a questions tab and um, and you can, uh, any questions you like the look of, you can upvote so that we can uh, focus on the ones that are uh, most interesting to folks. So I will um, invite, um, uh, my colleagues to answer these. So I think um, the first one is uh, is a margin question. So Phil, if you're able to come on stage and, um, and answer, uh, respond to this question. The question is, what margins are you making on dubbing now? And what will they be fully ramped when they're fully ramped up? Right, okay, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So at the moment, we are still in business development mode when it comes to dubbing. Uh, we're building the team, we're building the locations, and currently uh, our expectations on margin is is single digit, uh, around nine or ten percent tops. Uh, so that's where we are at the minute. Um, when it ramps up, because it is a, still a very small percentage of our business, but over the coming years, we would expect with our technology that we should be able to get between twenty-five and thirty percent margins. Great, thank you very much, Phil. Uh, the next question, uh, these are coming in thick and fast. Um, so the next question is, can you explain digital packaging in a bit more detail? What does it involve? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. So um, so when, when, when content is first produced, um, it's, um, it, I mean, it's usually digital these days, um, but these, each streaming service, so uh, a Netflix and Amazon or Disney Plus and so on, each have their own very particular requirements of how materials need to be submitted to them in order to be compatible with their platform. So it's a little bit like, you know, if you're producing, um, if you're producing a document, uh, if, you were some, if you were to send me a document, you might send it as a Microsoft Word document or you might send it as a PDF file. Uh, so when I open it, you know, I can read that document and, and the two would probably look pretty much the same. But clearly underneath, they're using different technologies. So if, if my intention is to edit the document that you send me, I probably want you to send it to me as a, as a Word rather than a PDF file. So in the same way, these streaming services have got each specified the way in which they want to receive different assets. So that's all the video assets. That is all the audio streams. It's the subtitles. It's the captions. It's the metadata which describes the content. Um, you know, it says it provides a synopsis of the plot, a, a list of the uh, the cast and crew, and 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 another information, um, and a whole range of other pieces. And these these elements all have to be uh, prepared and um, 
and uh, convert it into the right technical formats and then combined in the right way to form what's usually referred to as a package, a digital package. And then that package can be submitted to the particular streaming service. So when we do that in order to deliver a, a third party's content to Netflix, what we do is actually quite different from what we would do if, we were to, uh, if they would require to deliver it into Amazon. So digital packaging is actually for us, it's a catch-all term and it relates to any sort of manipulation processing, reformatting, conforming, and so on, of original materials in order to get them into the right formats um, that are specific to the individual uh, services to which they are uh, being delivered. Okay, um, the next question, um, uh, I think I'm gonna ask Gordon to uh, answer this one. Gordon, if you are able to come on stage. Uh, the question here is, why are you so confident about sales progress in the third quarter? Gordon's available. Yep, hello. Great. Uh, very handily, it, it muted you when I was joining the stage. So <laughs> what was the question? OK, the question was, why are you so confident about sales progress in the third quarter? Oh, OK. Uh, well, it's a pretty short answer. Uh, we're confident because we have the orders. Um, you know, we're just about to get into the third quarter. Um, we've actually got the orders in-house at the moment. Uh, we're beginning to process them and we know the value. So hence the confidence. That was an easy one. Uh, I'll give you all the easy ones, Gordon, if that's okay. Um, um, actually, was stay on the screen because so you can take the next one, I think. What is the pricing environment like? Uh, yeah, it's actually uh, it, good in the, uh, a short answer um uh, what we've seen is that as our customers are moving to this ott model uh Stuart showed you some slides earlier where the various uh um, customers start to move into that uh, area um there's much 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 more focus on quality than there was before um you know probably about six seven years ago it was almost like the race to zero on pricing especially around subtitling not so much in dubbing um, and that was because a lot of it was going to broadcast and it broadcast at the quality level, the threshold is definitely lower. But as they've moved to um, this online model where it's their content on their platform, they want to make sure they've got the best quality possible. And at that point, people are prepared to pay to make sure that we get you know high quality translators and QCs to do the work. So from that respect, the, the actual pricing is, uh, is encouraging in terms of where the benchmark is. Great, thank you. And in fact, actually, if you stay on for the next one, what are the biggest hurdles for Zoo to scale as a large player in this space? Um, so for us, I think it's all around um, engagement with some of these larger customers. You know, we, we've actually cracked that with a few, um, you know, one in particular that we, we, we all know about. But it's really making sure that um, as we engage with them, we engage across all the service lines. And as we said, you know, dubbing for us really is relatively new. It's the biggest spend for a lot of these uh, customers in terms of the localization spend. And, um, you know, we've seen some hurdles um, being accepted both from a technology point of view, as, as Stuart mentioned before, and also, you know, a creative point of view. We are we are seen as a bit of a technology company entering a, a creative space and dubbing is seen as a creative space. Um, so we've, you know, COVID-19 was a line in the sand, as Stuart mentioned, that got people to actually embrace um, the technology, you know, to, they, they didn't have much choice at that point. If they wanted work completed, it had to be recorded remotely. And uh, so for a lot of people that thought what we did was some form of witchcraft, um, they actually started to realize, you know, this is this is a valid way of doing it. And then the second part of that is, you know, us making sure that that uh, base of um, uh, directors and voice talent that we've got are the best that we can possibly have. Um, and that's something we're very, very focused on this year, you know, making sure that we've got the right people operating on the platform to create a great quality product. And I think if we get those two things right, um, we'll see just that wider adoption from our customers along the dubbing, which, like I say, is, is the biggest spend and therefore will uh, accelerate growth in terms of revenue. Thanks, Gordon. Don't go away. I think there are a few questions here that have got your name written all over them. Um, so the next one. Um, does Zoo Studio being taken up by a major media studio limit its ability to be taken up by that media studio's competitors? Uh, no, actually, it, it doesn't at all. So what we actually do with Zoo Studio is that we configure it 
for each one of our customers. So, you know, everybody has a slightly different workflow. They call things different things. So it's not a one size fits all. So in fact, you know, we deploy Zoo Studio for someone else, it would actually look like quite a different product than it would look like for, you know, a, another customer. So th there is no, um, uh, um, sort of, you know, line there where it says, oh, well, you've licensed it to these guys. We, we don't want any to do it anymore. It's, it's, it's really about, Zoo Studio was really all about solving a problem that we saw for our customer. Um, and one of, the, you know, one of the things we did in it, we recognized there's more than enough work to go around for all the vendors like us. So actually, Zoo Studio is, in fact, vendor agnostic. They can actually order with other vendors as well as with us. And it gives the studio this global platform where they can order all the services across all the languages. You know, and always we're one of the vendors that are supplying that. So we took that view to actually make it vendor agnostic on purpose because we knew if we just provide a solution that is only relevant to us, that would actually stop other uh, studios taking it up because it doesn't solve a problem for them. It just creates another problem. So the whole goal behind it was here's something we can give to our customers that makes their life easier. I actually makes our life easier because if they place orders, I don't have to get people to re-key orders and you can go off and process them. Um, so that was the whole goal behind it. So we're in dialogue with other studios. You know, we're, we're moving down a road with them. Um, and it's certainly not something that we've seen as, you know, would stop them moving forward with us. Great, thanks. And there's a related question, which is, what barriers are there for wider Zoo Studio adoption? Um, you know, most of it's around, a lot of these big studios have their own in-house technology groups that like to make the products for them. So usually there's someone inside, you know, trying to justify the job and they want to make a product. Um, I think a lot of the problems we've seen with, with our customers where they do that, I always say as soon as you start building a, a platform or a product, you just never stop building it. It, it just never goes away. You're always, uh, you know, upgrading it, changing little things, tweaking little things. And for a lot of in-house technology um, units at these studios, they move on to the next project. Finish that one, move on to the next one. Then the thing they built starts to languish, doesn't quite fit, fit the needs of the people using it. And as soon as you do that, people stop using it. They go back and start using spreadsheets because, you know, it makes their life easier in their view. So, so there's always that um, little um, dance between, you know, us as a vendor bringing a technology uh, solution that's, that's designed specifically for this to an internal studio want to do their own thing. Um, and sometimes they just will. They'll just go do it anyway and then find it two years later. It was a horrible idea and they shouldn't have done it. We've seen that happen with other people as well. So, um, so that's usually what it is. It's something like that. And you know these are large organisations, and you know some um, you know move quite slowly sometimes, some quite traditional, and uh, you know getting them to move to a brand new platform and, and operate slightly differently can be a challenge as well. Thanks. And uh, one last one for you, and I'll give you a break. It's uh, with the greater emphasis on back catalogue work. Do you think there's a likelihood of clients starting to dub that back catalogue? Presumably to 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 dub um, yeah back as content as as distinct from new content yeah so yeah I, one of the things we do when we talk Stuart was talking about this you know back catalog and media process and digital packaging what we generally do with the back catalog is that so the studio will say okay all these titles we want to get that on the platform and they'll say to us can you just go see what we've got and see if it all kind of glues together you know we think we've got all these languages dubbed and we think we've got all these languages subtitled. Can you go check that for us, please? So we'll go do that and we call it conforming. So we'll go get the video, we'll get the audio streams, we'll match them up, we'll, we'll QC them and make sure they're fit for purpose. Because you have to remember quite often, especially with features, there's been multiple, multiple cuts of these features. So sometimes the subs in the feature don't match. So we go do all of that and we'll report back and say, okay, here's what you've got that's good enough to go onto the platform. They'll then, they'll have a localization strategy, they'll call it. So for the platform, they'll say, okay, we want to be able to broadcast, well, make this available in all these various territories in these languages. That's what we want to do. Here's what we've got. Okay, we'll use what we've got and we'll make what we need for the rest. And so on those, we will see that they'll uh, quite often sub or dub those languages because they don't have them. And it's a decision they'll make uh, based on the content and on the region it's going to, you know, some people don't like dubs, some people don't like subs. Um, and also it's just it's more expensive, you know, dubbing is a lot more expensive than subtitling. So for some of that content, they'll just decide to subtitle it from a budgetary point of view. So probably a long answer to a short question. 
Um, yeah, we do see them starting to order dubs for the back catalog as well, but it just depends on the localization strategy and what they've got and the budget they've got against them. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, I'll take a couple of the questions now to give Gordon a break. Um, there's a question, uh, do you anticipate consolidation within the localization industry? And I guess the backdrop to this is a recent announcement perhaps um, of uh, RWS to buy SDL. So obviously that's quite a big, uh, big consolidation there going on that's creating the largest uh, provider of, uh, I guess, generalist localization services um, um, you know, more widely. Clearly we, we play in a niche, so, so we are entirely focused on media localization. And in, in our industry, uh, media localization is obviously consists of subtitling and dubbing. And when we look at uh, what's happening, um, you know, with the, the, the trend for uh, in, in demand for these kinds of services, you know, we recognize that, you know, that there will be an ongoing requirement for both subtitling and dubbing. We anticipate actually requirements for dubbing were are likely to increase in that, um, that there are more countries into which content is being distributed that uh, where audiences will be happier to receive content dubbed in, into their own uh, local languages. So um, when we look around at the providers of you know, our, our competitors who are providing these services, they are all those traditional type vendors that we um, spoke of, um, uh, that we talked about earlier in the presentation. They're all very much kind of bricks and mortar. They have physical studios. Um, so just as a, as a kind of point of reference, that's not that's not the game we're in. We are not, uh, you know, we, we have a strategy uh, and, a te and technology platforms that mean that we do not need to own and operate multiple dedicated dubbing studios in, in many countries in order to be able to offer scale to our clients. On the contrary, we can do that in a much more capital efficient way, in a, in a, in a much more uh, scalable way. Um, so that said, uh, um, amongst those competing companies, um, there has been consolidation in the last year, um, two big players, um, IUNO Media Group and BTI Studios um, combined to form um, a single organization. Um, so that, organ that, that company is, um, offers both subtitling and dubbing services, but um, dubbing has it's been a big, um, a significant component of, of their sales, and which obviously has been impacted through this period. So in terms of uh, consolidation, um, there are a small number of big players. There are a very few players in the industry who can offer end-to-end -end services as we do. Uh, there are a larger number of smaller players. Um, uh, I don't. I don't see. Um, I don't see any major consolidation efforts um, continuing to play out. Um, but it will be interesting to see how things transpire, particularly if the if you know if the delay on new content coming to market is is prolonged still further um, amongst these traditional providers and how they respond to that um, that particular challenge. Okay. Um, Another question, are there any major media production companies out there you would still like to work with? Um, and the answer is yes, there are, there are plenty of them. Um, if you look at our client list, um, such as the one that I, I put on the slide earlier, we're already working to some degree with, uh, with pretty much all of the leading um, providers of, um, of of content in English as an as, as its original language, so um, so mostly kind of U.S. studios and some uh, U.K.-based uh, studios. So clearly, there are content producers all around the world. Um, our proposition is primarily designed to help organizations to take content and to purpose that content across many languages for worldwide distribution. So um, so so for us, it's it's organizations that have that characteristic. And, um, and, and, you know, the, the major clients we're working with are already uh, typically uh, working that way. Um, many international companies will often license their content to third parties rather than seek to actually sort of globalize it themselves. Um, so, um, so I think all the, in, in, in terms of North American providers, most of them are already working with. And our job now is really to scale up the volume of work that we're providing uh, to them. Okay, a few more questions. Um, okay, uh, so there's a question here. Uh, uh, this is one for you, Phil. So if you'd like to, to come on stage. Um, the question is, 
In tomorrow's Capital Markets Day, there's a section called Road to $100 million in sales. Could we get a glimpse into what the roadmap for that is today? Um, did you get that question, Phil? I did get that question. <laughs> I'm not sure whether I should be answering it, to be honest. Yeah. It's been embargo till tomorrow, but um, I think um, Stuart has partly answered that question. If you look at our business today, um, it is predominantly uh, subtitling um, with a, a, a healthy um, uh, volume of media processing, digital packaging, and, and a small amount of, of dubbing. And that's roughly what our business is today. And what we'll be talking through tomorrow is how we take that 30 million and in the medium term, we take that to 100 million. And that really is about uh, uh, obviously doubling those first two categories, but really uh, looking to move the dubbing by a factor of 10. Um, but what, what uh, we will uh, talk about is that in actual fact, as Stuart has just said, really, and I know there's a few other questions, we're really only targeting 10 customers who are all customers of ours today. And really the, the challenge for, for Zoo is to become one of their prime vendors. Um, we have already achieved that with one client. Uh, and what we're saying is that we need to get, you know, four or five of those others as our, our as prime vendors for us. And then we will be in a situation where um, we'll be at that target. So it's about account management and getting them to adopt our services. So, so that's what we'll be talking through in a bit more detail tomorrow. Great, thank you very much, Phil. Okay. Um, right, um, uh, next question which I can take. In your 2020 report, you increased the overall number of dubbing clients from 23 to 29. How big is your list of potential dubbing clients? So this, uh, this uh, obviously, you can reference the, uh, the previous two answers, uh, really, to put this in one in context. Um, so if you think about dubbing and um, uh, the kind of dubbing that will be commissioned around the world, um, quite a large proportion of it is commissioned on a local basis. So think of a, for example, a, um, you know, a cable company that operates in Germany um, and is providing um, content to a German uh, consumer audience. So they will have some licensing department that goes off and licenses um, content from other countries. Um, uh, so uh, countries obviously that produce content that is not in German as its original language. And Germany is a country where audience expect content to be dubbed rather than subtitled. So, um, and, and that's a, a characteristic that varies country to country. So some, some countries like the UK generally prefer foreign language content to be subtitled, but countries like Germany, France, Italy, Spain, uh, audiences there prefer actually to for it to be dubbed. So this, um, so a uh, a cable company in Germany that licenses some say English original content from a, a US based um, a studio will need to dub it for the local market. Typically, what they'll do is they'll place that work with a local German dubbing studio um, in order to prepare it for that uh, uh, for, for to go out through their through their channels. So so it, so much of the dubbing that is commissioned in the industry widely is actually usually just for a single language um, and commissioned on a local basis. Now we can we could do that work of course. Um, but we have set ourselves up with uh you know with infrastructure with systems platforms with the capability so that um, clients who place work with us uh, can entrust us to actually produce localized materials both subtitled and dubbed across any number of languages. So that's that's kind of the mode that we really like to work in because that way we can really add a significant value to our clients and we can do that work in a very efficient way because we can amortize common costs of, of setting those projects up across many different languages. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so, so for us, the, the primary, as, as, as we touched on a moment ago, the primary clients that we're pursuing, um, and many of whom we already have as clients, are those that are producing content and they themselves are taking responsibility and uh, commissioning localization for many, for multiple languages. Um, so, uh, so, there, there are, so there are many clients around the world that we could provide dubbing for. The, the ones that we are targeting 
are those who have essentially an international proposition and require um, languages on a, on a global scale. Next question um, from Alex, a follow-up to the digital packaging question. Why would a third party send materials to you to send to Amazon or Netflix rather than send it direct to the streamers? Um, so this is, uh, this is uh, that's a great question, actually. And um, and you would think that well you know if you're if you're a production company and you've made a, a movie or a TV series and you've done a deal with Netflix, you know you could you could do all that you could um, you know, get it in the right formats and submit it into the Netflix platform and um, and therefore cut out an organisation like us from from doing that. Uh, the fact is that that doesn't happen, and the reason it doesn't happen is because organisations like Netflix, um, you, you know, they have a, a quality reputation. Um, and they need to be sure that anything that goes into their platform is first rate quality. And so the way that Netflix in particular works is that they have uh, a number of programs, one of which is called a, a Netflix preferred fulfillment partner. Um, and, and we are one of those, um, those partners. And Netflix preferred fulfillment partners essentially have been vetted by Netflix. And Netflix is satisfied that they can not only do work to the required standard, but that they can be trusted to submit the materials directly into Netflix's systems. Um, and, and that's a, a privilege that is reserved for a, a small number of companies that have, have passed through these stringent tests uh, of Netflix. So, um, so essentially, when Netflix does a licensing deal, so let's say with a small independent and has produced a TV series, Netflix will say to that company, OK, so now, you've, uh, now we've done the license, you, you must work with one of our preferred vendors in order to get this content in the right formats and uh, packaged in the right way uh, for our play out. And, um, and, and they kind of mandate that. And that's true of, um, of most of the, of, of the services that they, uh, you know, it's absolutely imperative that when materials arrive, they're all in the right format, they're all properly packaged. And, um, and obviously you can imagine if you allowed anybody to submit content or all sorts of horrible things could go wrong. Um, uh, okay, next question. With freelance growth percentage slowing between 19 and 20, what are the main obstacles to growing capacity? Hmm, interesting question. So um, we're in a different phase now, really, of growing our, our freelancer network. Uh, the early, uh, the early uh, years of, of, that, of growing that network were really about subtitling and bringing on board a, you know, a community of translators who are specialists in, in media translation to help us uh, uh, to do subtitling. And obviously, more recently, we have um, also started to build up the pool for uh, for dubbing services. And um, and so, consequently, what you're seeing when you when you look at the growth in the number of freelancers, um, you're seeing basically we're we're just at a different phase and focused on different activities. Also, in in FY20, we uh, took the opportunity to basically revisit our database, which obviously went back many years. You know, we've been providing subtitling services for nine years. So we went through and, and basically reassessed all of our translators and, and purged our database of individuals who essentially no longer were available sufficiently for us to rely upon as one of our trusted uh, partners for, for, for translation. So we basically purged out a lot, of, um, a lot of individuals. So in the most recent update that we reported, what you're seeing there is a net increase. Um, you know, they, uh, all of the new additions of, of new folks we brought on board less those that we purged from the database. Um, and, and, uh, and so the answer to the question about, you know, what, what are the obstacles to growth? It's really actually about us focusing now, particularly in the area of dubbing, since that's where, uh, you know, the, the axis of growth is, is, is directed for us. And it's about, for us, focusing on the key languages. And initially, uh, currently, there are about 15 of them that we are focused on primarily, and making sure that we have uh, the right talent um, in each of those languages. So it's not just a case of getting, you know, it's, it's not it's not a, really a numbers game, actually. It's about quality. So quality is all important. And um, and having voice actors and dubbing directors that have the right reputation, that are experienced in, in dubbing. And as I, as I touched on earlier, dubbing is a real art form. And it requires some really very particular skills, a combination of particular skills. And, you know, a regular actor, um, uh, you know, may, you know, many regular actors would find it very challenging to do dubbing. It's, it's something that has to be learned. 
and we need to make sure we get those kind of premium people um, into our um, into our database as part of our network, and um, and and that's where we'll be focused in the in the period ahead. Um, and uh, looks like we've got one question left, so we've done pretty well. Um, and the question is, will it be possible to replay tomorrow's capital up capital update through LiveStorm? Um, so we haven't um, we haven't yet decided actually whether we will publish uh, the Capital Markets Day. Um, uh, but uh, but if we do, we will make it available uh, on our website, and uh, you'll be able to find it there. So I think that appears to complete all of the questions that, that were asked. So I think we've actually completed a head of schedule. So um, yes, I, well, I'd just like to thank um, uh, uh, my fellow board colleagues for being part of this session and uh, answering all these questions and to the audience for uh, posing uh, a good good collection of questions there and uh with that i think we'll bring the uh the session to a close so uh thank you very much everyone